So I decided uh, for the title Microbial Networks. I, I was not aware that Victorio is so interested in networks, but I hope that I can explain a lot of these networks here during my talk. And uh, I have two affiliations. So one is our university. This is uh, Graz University of Technology. And the other one is the ASIP. So this is an Austrian Center of Industrial Biotechnology because I'm in the faculty of chemistry, engineering, and biotechnology. And we have this center. And uh, this is open for cooperation between industry and university. And for us, it's, it's very good to have this second uh, possibility for cooperation. And so I will start. Yeah, this is my group. So I have uh, 30 people, but a lot of students for sure. And not so many people are paid by the university directly. So most of them have an external funding. So here is Graz. Uh, so it's not so far away from the, from the border and not so far from Trieste. And the institute is environmental biotechnology. And we try to com combine basic uh, research on microbial ecology. So I'm an ecologist and microbiologist with biotechnology and with a specific uh, focus on the plant microbiome and on biocontrol. But uh, today, we also moved a little bit to the human microbiome because it's so interesting also to see the parallels. And I will show you also a little bit of this research, because normally it's, it's much more interesting to learn something about uh, ourselves and uh, from plants, but I will do both. So yeah, here, this is the institute in the, in the back, and this is the group. It was from last year, the picture. And we have also two startups at our institute, which is re really nice to have them. One is Biotense, and um, this is more like a think tank, so they, they have knowledge in formulation of bacteria, for example, for seed application. But now we're also working on fecal transplant to uh, develop a formulation for specific donors for fecal transplant for, for risk patients. And we have another one, this is Room Biotic. And uh, they work on the indoor microbiome to find, on one hand, new ways for steril sterilization, which is important for several things like intensive care units and also for the production for pharmaceutical approaches. And on the other side, we are also working on indoor microbiomes because they are very important for our health. And uh, a lot of diseases come from, from these problems with the indoor microbiome. Yeah, this is the background, and now I will move to research. Yeah, due, <laughs> due to, to all these new techniques which we have, next generation <coughs> techniques, all these omic techniques, but also novel metabolomics approaches and microscopy is also very important now. Uh, we, we see that all the eukaryotes are more or less holobionts. So, or meta-organisms, as we call them. And uh, they act in many, many, many things together. And for the plant microbiome, for example, uh, a lot of, uh, for plants, a lot of bacteria allow germination. So there are several branches of, of, of plants, for example, orchids or bryophytes. They con cannot germinate alone. So they need really specific micro for germination. Also plant growth, health and performance is, is strongly correlated with the plant microbiome. So, and, and you know there are much more genes and much more cells available from the microbiome than from the plants themselves. It, it is similar to us, so our microorganisms have a weight of two kilogram. So, and this, this is like the brain and it's very important for us and it is very similar to the, to the plants. So, and we realized that this networking between the plant and the microbiome is very, very important. And at least all diseases are associated with imbalances or as uh, it, this comes from medicine, they called it dysbiosis. And 
I, I, this is my introduction. So, and uh, today I would like to give you some examples for these networks, how it works, how specific the, they are. And uh, then I would also uh, like to show you a little bit about the connection to other microbiomes. And in the, in the third point, I would like to show you some uh, solutions how we can avoid these dysbiosis effects by biocontrol. So these are my three points. So first I will give you several examples. I, I selected uh, three examples for, for the network analysis and then I will give you also an overview about our research on this. And then here this is, uh, you can see it as an excursion to other ex environments. Uh, this is only a short part and, and then the last part is uh, biocontrol, focus on biocontrol uh, stages. So I would like to start with mosses. So 10 years before we, stat we started with the moss analysis because these are the oldest land plants which exist on earth and we thought they should have a very good relationship to their microbiome and uh, therefore we selected them as model organisms to understand plant microbe interaction. And this is really a basic project. We have here the Austrian Basic Science Foundation, FWF, uh, who supported this project. So we, we, uh, I started it here in, in Rostock at the Baltic Sea. So for many years I lived there uh, before I moved to Graz, so 10 years before. And uh, the northern hemisphere is covered by these bog ecosystems and also Russia. And here these are my Russian colleagues and this is Anastasia uh, and she was a project leader of, of this one. Yeah, and as I told you, these are living fossils and when we started there was more or less no knowledge about it, the uh, microorganisms. But we thought that especially in, in these uh, ecosystems, so these bog ecosystems, they, they are ombotrophic living uh, rooms, so that means that they live only from the rain, so they, they need a lot of support from their microbiome to exist and to, to, to grow. And as I told you, since 10 years now, we, we study these ecosystems. And by the way, they are also very important for our climate uh, because they are the most important carbon so sink sources. So also the alp alpine box, so they are very, very important. And these are the first ones which are affected by climate change. So. Here you can see a leaf of a, a sphagnum and you can see that there are a lot of bacteria inside. So this is a specific probe for archaea, therefore there are not so many. And uh, this was also interesting because, uh, as I told you, we, we had this project together with Russians and uh, we found a very, very high similarity between the microbiome of the Austrian box and the Russian box, although the plant specificity was very high. So these sphagnum plants, there exist 300 different species, al although for us they look, uh, all, all of them look uh, like, uh, like the same, but the biologists, they can differentiate them. And we, we found a highly similar microbiome so far away. And therefore, we thought there should be a mechanism behind why we have this similarity, because they, they are very old. And how can it be that it is so similar? So partly, we found the same clones. And then we developed the hypothesis that maybe from one generation to the other, they will give a core microbiome to to the new moss generation and here we have a haploid generation of the uh, gametophyte and then we have the sporophyte this is a diploid generation of the plant and indeed we really found that associated with the spores inside of the sporophyte here is uh, the moss and here's the sporophyte you can see here a high diversity i will not go into detail into that but 
they really give their new plants uh, in an oculum and surprisingly all these which we found here in the core microbiome they are well known for nutrient supply so for nitrogen fixation phosphorus solubilization and so on so <laughs> at, at, at least it's like like humans it's a parallel because here you know that during birth, so we also, the mother gives a newborn an, an oculum, which was for a long time, it was ignored. And by the way, so I think Italy is one of, has one of the highest proportions of Caesar section, which, which is really not good for the babies because then they get the microbiome from the hospital indoor microbiome, which is normally characterized by a lot of multi-resistant pathogens. So going back to the mosses, learning from the mosses <laughs> and give nat natural birth here to the, to the younger people. Yeah, this is an insight into the capsule of the mosses. Here are a lot of bacteria in, 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 in red. And uh, this was the first evidence that also the plants can give these core microbiome to, to the new generation. Now it is also known for seeds and, and for other plants, but due to the huge diversity of plant families, it, it is specific for, for each plant uh, family. So they, the, the plants develop specific strategies so to handle their microbiome, but the mosses, so they are so intelligent to do this. Yeah, and uh, here again a picture from, from a, a moss leaf. You can see here very nice colonies inside of, of these cells. And here you can also see that they interact with each other, so it would be nice to have here some complementary genomics. And what we have done here also for, the, uh, for our sphagnum uh, microbiome, we sequenced the whole metagenome, so including all functions. So we, we, we isolated it and, and then we sequenced all the genes which are associated here. We found thousand different species, so it's, it's similar to the gut, so it's, 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 it's uh, high diversity. And so uh, the first point was that we got such an amount of data that we destroyed one of our TU server, so which was not expected that it comes from us because we have a huge faculty of computer science and normally they handle a lot of big data, but we had more data for one sphagnum uh, microbiome than, uh, than all our computer specialists. But at the end we were able to handle it also with help from outside, but you, you really need a lot of, uh, of capacity to assess those things. So, and then we, here there's a MGRAST server, which is very nice. It's provided from, from the US, and then you can compare your data set with all the other metagenomes. So if you publish anything about a metagenome, you also have to put it into such a public server as MGRAST, but it's at the moment, so they have also uh, problems to, to because to, to pay for the storage is very difficult, so, but you can give it to China or to, to, to the US. And so you can see here our microbiome is in between the plants and the fresh water, which makes sense because the, these bogs are also covered by water. Here are the human microbiomes, which are in, in MG Rust. So in B you get an unbelievable amount of data and you can assemble all of them and, and make some pathways for nitrogen fixation and for everything. So, and before we started this analysis, so this was Anastasia, a postdoc for three months. She only was inside of this data set. So we developed some hypothesis about the function, of, about unique functions of our microbiome. And we thought they should supply a lot of nutrients and they should be also responsible for pathogen defense because these bog ecosystems they are monocultures at low pH and normally there should be a lot of um, of uh, fungal pathogens inside as in our agricultural fields but they are not known in contrast 
So these mosses, especially these sphagnum mosses, are well known for traditional use in antifungal activity. And uh, here also we used it, or our uh, ancestors used this as natural nappies. So uh, in Europe, it was widely used, and the last use was during World War II. So the soldiers used it for one wound covering because it has this water holding capacity on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, hand this antifungal capacity, which was really nice against fungal infections, for example, for babies, for candida against candida infection. So, and we found some here, this is a comparison of our metagenome with all functions in comparison to all the other metagenomes. And we found some of our hypothesis could be performed. So, for example, they provide a lot of nutrient and they uh, have unique features for, to avoid stress tolerance against abiotic and biotic stress. This was nice, but we found also several surprising things because I thought this is a very old ecosystem and it should be well developed, but we had a, a higher uh, interaction via quorum sensing than all the other metagenomes. So it seems that they exchange a lot and talk, talk a lot. And uh, in parallel, a lot of horizontal gene transfer and a high number of mobile elements, which I had not expected before. Yeah, this was a metagenome. And now we performed a metagenome on the whole Bok ecosystem, so including also all vascular plants. And so uh, then here, the uh, grasses, mosses, peat mosses, and also shrubs, Pinus mugu, and uh, all these vaccinium species are inside. And then we calculated a core microbiome. And at the end, we found out that the whole bog is connected by these sphagnum mosses, which is clear because whenever you have seen any bog ecosystem, so it's dominated by them. And the, key, the bacterial keystone species is Bocalderia. So Bocalderia is here completely in the core. So a lot of these, from the plant-associated group of Bocalderia, we, we found a lot. This is the most dominant, and it occurs on all bog plants. So on the first level of the plants, uh, sphagnum is a keystone species, and on <coughs> the bacterial level, uh, Bocalderia is the keystone species. So, coming from mosses to sugar beet, and now we are, by, by the way, here are a lot of uh, wild sugar beets, so we ha also have investigated those, and it was also interesting to see that they lost a lot of diversity from, from this natural uh, here place on the Mediterranean Sea, so that the domestication really, uh, it's also a breeding of the microbiome, but it is indirectly, so they don't, do not know that. So, and this is the last example, this is a lettuce. And uh, we had a project that was funded by the EU and is together with our other university in Graz and also with Rita Gosch in Großbeeren. And yeah, here is a rhizosphere colonization and you really can see that there are a lot of bacteria. And this is work done by Massimiano, so we have always some Italians in our group. And what I don't know is, before we started this project, is that lettuce is a very, very old uh, plant of, of mankind. So also in old China, so they breeded a lot of, of, of lettuce and in Egypt. And it is very difficult to follow the breeding lines of lettuce. So I thought it's more modern to eat lettuce, but it, it, it's not true. And there exist so many cultivars worldwide and it's very difficult to get an overview. But fortunately we had this cooperation with Arche Noah. This is a, a, in Austria, it, it is a, it's not a company, 
it's a group of people associated with Boku, and they try to maintain all the all cultivars, and they also uh, cul cultivate them into the field. And here we uh, selected eight different cultivars, and the wild type, this Lactuga cereola, you can find it as a wheat outside. And we compared these nine plants, uh, species and, and cultivars, and here we analyzed, Massimiliano analyzed the rhizosphere, and surprisingly we found 50% is a core, and 12% are really cultivar-specific bacteria. So, and, and, and this shows that breeding really influenced the microbiome of us. Uh, of, of not of us, <laughs> first of the lettuce plants, but when we eat, then also our microbiome. And um, yeah, and using uh, here this, all these uh, weeds which we had, we performed a network analysis. It was published by the Knight Group to 2011. So you, n you need a lot of replicates, and then you can perform that this network analysis. And uh, we compared it with all the other networks which were published uh, for microbiomes. And we found that especially lettuce has a very, very loose structure. And our conclusion was that maybe this explain why lettuce has very often pathogens, but it is also very good for biocontrol. So if you look into the literature and also our own experience is that biocontrol in lettuce works very well. And maybe this could be ex explained due to this loose network structure which allowed other species to invade into this network. So, but uh, it is interesting because, yeah, there is a diversity but they are not connected with, with each other. Yeah, and we also went into uh, the metagenome of the, uh, of the lettuce to, to understand the relationship. And it is surprisingly, you found a lot of enterobacteria on the lettuce phylosphere, uh, normally the people from the administration, for example, they only analyze pa pathogens on, on lettuce, but uh, you we could show that they belong to the natural community on the lettuce phylosphere and that they are especially associated with the phylosphere and not with the, with the root. Yeah, these are the functions. Yeah, you can do here everything and compare then the function, how, how it changed from soil to the phylosphere and maybe it's it's, it's nicer to go to, to this picture because otherwise you need a lot of time to go into the detail of all these networks and on, of, on all these uh, figures. But as I told you, we, we compared the soil microbiome, the rhizosphere microbiome and the phylosphere microbiome. And in the first uh, picture you, you could see this uh, rhizosphere uh, colonization by bacteria. So but we were not able to find any bacteria in, under the microscope for the phylosphere. But we, we saw the diversity in the amplicons and in the metagenome, but, but not by microscopy. And it took more than a year that we found the reason for that. The reason is that all the uh, leaves are covered by a wax layer, and the wax layer uh, has an antibacterial effect, so there's more or less no bacterium on, on this wax layer. In some cases, we, we find si single colonies, but maybe they were only from the air. So all the bacteria moved inside, and they live inside their endophytes of, uh, of the lettuce leaves. And you can see here really a dense colonization below the wax layer, as well as here inside of the tissue, but you cannot see any outside. So that means we eat huge di microbial diversity by lettuce, and uh, 
first it was really a surprise th that we eat so many enterobacteria with this lettuce, but uh, after avoiding lettuce for two weeks, we start again eating lettuce, and then we developed uh, the theory that it is a natural vaccination which we get by the lettuce eating, and may maybe it's m much more important for our health uh, than to eat because there are not so many minerals and so <laughs> provided by by letters and we uh, also published this as an opinion paper and we will now go on to really uh, show the relationship because it's it's interesting uh, our immune system reacts mainly with enterobacteria so it develops by the contact of especially of this group uh, i don't know why but it seems to be uh, uh, important in the past so uh, hope you will have a salad uh, for for lunch today, so that you will be healthy. I will conclude this, which is my biggest, uh, the biggest chapter of my talk here, because this is our main work, uh, this basic work on the plant microbiome, and uh, a small overview about the other things which we worked on, and uh, which shows you this. Uh, a conclusion that diversity and networking helps to avoid pathogen outbreaks and uh, is against pathogenicity. So we also worked with grapes with, uh, in, in vineyards and we could show that the organically managed uh, systems have a higher diversity uh, than the conventional managed uh, grape uh, systems, which was a surprise for, for us. So, but it seems here that also a lot of natural biocontrol agents are enriched in these systems. And this was also in collaboration. We have Silberberg, and this is also uh, not a university, but all the people working on the vineyards. Styria has uh, 3,000 of these private vineyards, and they produce also very good wine, by the way. So it's not, not industrially produced, it's really private with, uh, with their own. I think many Italians like this also to come to, to Styria and uh, enjoy this. So it's, it's really true that also inside of the grapes there's huge diversity and uh, a lot of our farmers, they produce a wine with the indigenous mic microbes which works well. And by the way, they are really important for, uh, for the taste of the wine because the microbes produce a lot of these uh, specific compounds which is inside of the wine. So then we had also these uh, studies about the wild type uh, and uh, this is a similar study which I showed you for the lettuce we have done with, uh, uh, with the sugar beet and we found also that here breeding has an enormous impact on the microbiome and it is really important for the breeders to integrate this in their strategies. And uh, for a long time I have also a project with medicinal plants. So you know that the medicinal plants produce a lot of antibacterial, antifungal in ingredients <coughs> and they have a very specific um, microbiome and Surprisingly, this was the highest diversity we ever found uh, associated here with chamomile and with, uh, with Solano, uh, not what is Ringelblume, Calendula. And um, yeah, this is very important diversity and m can, there's also an interaction between the ingredients, between the bio and active ingredients for chamomile, for example, and the bacteria. And it could be that also one of the effects of the medicinal plants is their microbiome and not only the substances. And we, we had a, a collaboration with Cordoba University and with an institute, agricultural institute, about uh, the vascular wild and olive trees, which is verticillium. You can see here the dry olives and this is yeah, this is in, in Spain, it is a really devastating, serious disease, not in, 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 in Greek, 
because there the diversity is, is higher, so it comes from management practices. Uh, this was established there because uh, they, uh, it is correlation with the diversity of higher plants. And we also worked with bananas, with Uganda, and with uh, this is our main crop in Styria, so the wine and <laughs> the oilseed pumpkin, and with also with, with strawberry. And uh, so the conclusion is really that diversity associated with the plants and networking is very important for the health of the plant. And the other conclusion is that we have a specific microbiome. Uh, it depends on the plant species. For, for example, for the monocotyledonous plants, there is not so much diversity than for the decotyledonous donus plants and uh, the specificity can be explained by the transfer via pollen or seeds and by the secondary metabolites and the morphology of the roots. Yeah, this, these are several references about the, uh, about the specific plant associated microbiomes. It started with cultivation then with fingerprints, so this is uh, a review of Connie and mine because we had for a long time, six years together, a project about this plant-specific effects, and now it was also in, in, in nature for Arabidopsis because you know that Arabidopsis is our most important plant. So then a short excursion to the intensive care unit. So I had a pro project with a clean room a, a, a company which produced clean rooms and also those equipment for the intensive care unit. And they uh, had so many problems with their sterility inside. And so first, I, 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 yeah, I don't like the project because I, I thought, I'm working with plants and I will not go into this sterile environment. But now I'm really happy because I learned a lot uh, from these environments. And the most important thing what I learned was that um, the beneficials inside of this intensive care union, they, they are coming from plants. So plants are a very important source. The phylosphere of plants is a very important source for the beneficial bacteria uh, in, inside. So, and we need these stable communities, as I told you, but we need it also in, indoor. And you all to this management and hygiene practices, uh, it is more or less destroyed. And then you have only this network of the multi-resistant pathogens. And the only source for good bacteria is sometimes to open the window and let uh, some in. And when we have done this, uh, this study, it was also a problem because we found all these plant-associated bacteria. And then they said, we cannot publish this because we are not allowed to open the window, but we, we are doing it because it's normal uh, thinking to do that. And here, we have done it together with, with our people from the university hospital. And we found out that by their method, they only found 2.5% of this diversity. And they, they cannot assess all these bacteria which are indoor, so, but they are really important for our health. And what, what I found really interesting, because for a long time I worked with, with biocontrol and plants, the people are skeptical about this, and especially the farmers and the companies. And I thought if we publish the study about the uh, hospitals that they are so full of bacteria, so it, uh, they, they, they will kill me. But it was completely the opposite. So this is here uh, the response from the, from the journals, and this is uh, Kronzeitung, so this is very low <laughs> intelligent level. But, but they formulate the sentence, the fight of bacteria within hospitals. They, they were on the side of the bacteria, so this surprised me completely. Or the, the hospital need good bacteria. So it, it was so, they, they see it much more than all the farmers which, uh, which then we have worked. So, and we checked all the literature uh, about the indoor microbiomes and plant microbiomes, and we could really uh, formulate our hypothesis that plant-associated 
bacteria are the source for beneficials. And now we also, uh, here we also could uh, show it for the, for house plants, because all these brown dots, so these are uh, bacteria coming from the plants, which are green, and landing on surfaces and in the air. So it is really a, a source for beneficials. And now we have this complete here, this interaction of the microbiomes, because now the people are focused on one microbiome wise microbiome also. But everything is so well connected in, in our ecosystems. And uh, here it was shown, for example, last year in Nature, that the people, uh, that the, the bacteria from the plant microbiome survive. They survive everything, the stomach and the gut, and they enhance our diversity. So and therefore, if you eat the lettuce, it stimulates not only our immune system, it enhances also the gut diversity. So we have seen this uh, link and also for the human uh, microbiome and the indoor microbiome, it was shown here in 2012, per hour we emit 10 to the 6 bacteria. So if we sit here together, we also exchange our microbiome and at the end it <laughs> you will not have my, my knowledge, so you will also have a little bit of the microbiome. So, and this was a link now from the microbiome to the plant microbiome, which I have shown you here. And by the way, there are a lot of links from the human microbiome to the plant microbiome. So first we thought that it is so unique, so but now analyzing and understanding all these functions and e ecological rules, we really see that there are a lot of links. And if you want to read something about the human microbiome, it is a really nice book about uh, missing microbes, so about the human microbiome from, from Martin Blazer from New York City, so it's very interesting. Yeah, these are the similarities. So we have different microenvironments, so our skin, our mouth, our stomach, and our gut. Everything is connected. The plant, for the plant, we created these nice names, rhizosphere, phylosphere, endosphere. So we have the early stage perturbations, which is well known for humans in the first three years. So then they get a lot of diseases. And also for the plants, it's well known in the first weeks. So there are a lot of uh, dumping off, so-called dumping off diseases. And then we have a very stable microbiome over the whole active life. And then we have the senescent phase with a lot of enterics. So in both cases, these are the endobacteria here. We have a host microbe co-evolution for everything. We have a vertical transmission of the microbiome for, for humans and for most of the plants, uh, with exception of Arabidopsis. And uh, so the human management practices cause a lot of diversity. This was very well shown in this Martin Blazer book, so that a lot of diseases which we now have, these chronic diseases, asthma and all these gut things and so it really comes because we don't have these bacteria anymore and uh, together with his wife he investigated the Indians in the Amazon and in Africa people and they have much more diversity than, than we. So maybe in Italy it's still fine because you have good food but the traditional western diet, the American diet is very 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 bad. So and um, yeah, the function is there are a lot of similarities and the composition is also very similar. And normally bacteria are the key players, but we should not forget the archaea, which are everywhere, also in plants. So we found a lot of archaea, by the way, in, tree, in olive trees and in, in other plants. And also the, fun uh, the, the fungi are there and also the pro protists and so on. Diseases are often associated with a dysbiosis, and we don't know what was the first, the dysbiosis or the pathogen. I think the, the imbalance. And we have this diversity-pathogenicity relationship, which is well established and the, the only importance for diversity, I think. 
and the microbiome interact a lot with the hormone system, also with, with our hormone system, and this should be the reason that a lot of young women cannot be cannot get pregnant because of these uh, they have an overproduction of hormones by their gut microbes. And we have also this host microbe rhythm relationship, which I like very much because it explains our problems with jet lag. <coughs> uh, and the jet lag is not the problem of our cells, it's a problem of the microbiome. And if you avoid to eat anything during the long flights, so then you will not have these problems with jet lag, so, which is very nice. So at least I will give you some conclusions for biocontrol. So as I told you for a long time, I'm working in this field and it completely changed also my mind about uh, biocontrol. And I would now uh, call it advanced biocontrol technologies or microbome control because it's not possible to use uh, single organisms and don't take care. But sometimes it works. So here are our products. It is for this is an endophyte also fighting against Didymella on bacteria pathogens on on the oilseed pumpkin, which is an important disease. Not so much the uh, Didymella, but in, it invades into the pumpkin, and then we have a lot of Xanthomonas and Avenia, and they fermented the whole inner tissues and then you cannot use them. We have here Salavida, this is by Sosong Padena, so we developed it and then we give it to the company. And we have also the Rhizostar against Verticillium wild and strawberry. But now we try also to use this knowledge from which we obtained from, from our basic research and to transfer these uh, these ideas to new biocontrol approaches and Christine has developed here such a new technique to catch uh, from natural vegetation bacteria so we isolate the microbial f the whole microbial fluxion for example for mosses it works so well and uh, then we treat the seeds and the rhizosphere and the phyllosphere and then we, we, we look uh, by these molecular techniques who is able to establish and we were able to develop a very interesting cocktails of stress protecting agents they come from the moss and ended up in in sugar beet and they are they are already in the commercial development so it was very fast because it works so well and this was due to the fact that we learned that the microbiome of sphagnum is so effective to w protect the plants against abiotic stress and it works easier than th against biotic stress because uh, yeah, with the biotic stress you have a lot of more components so you can use that and you can also use uh, <coughs> the mining of metagenomic data set to find new substances and new enzymes and to combine this knowledge with the isolation of microbes with all these functional approaches this is what we are doing in the ASIP and this is uh, the last point this is here one of the stress protection uh, agent this is Stenotrophomonas rhizophila uh, here it is in salinated soil and here it is treated with uh, Stenotrophomonas and I isolated this strain already during my PhD thesis and uh, for a long time I'm working with a strain but in, in former times it was only basic research uh, because we, we were working for a long time about the differentiation of opportunistic uh, pathogens because they are close relatives to Stenotrophomonas rhizophila which uh, since the 80s they cause a lot of uh, uh, problems in hospitals and yeah after 15 years and now it comes to, to another point and because it was in, in a collection, in a culture collection with our Uzbekistan project and there it works so well against uh, this abiotic stress because they have highly salinated soil it is unbelievable that plants can grow inside of the soil, you know, all these problems with the Aral Sea and Amadaya, Surdaya system. So, yeah, and now it was possible <laughs> by 
by uh, transcriptomic analysis to detect the mode of action in former times I, I analyzed it for a long time by all biochemical and genomics and so on and we found out interestingly that uh, the reaction of root extracts, verticillium stress and abiotic stress is the production of glycosylglycerol. We know that from our former studies this is a very effective osmoprotectant and uh, it protects um, the roots against the salinity. And the other one is spermidine. So this was first a surprise because I never heard that bacteria can produce it. But then we found that it is not only a very important substance protecting the human sperma against any stress. It's also produced by plants and by other organisms. And it on nature, the nature title was the novel anti-aging drug. So it, it is difficult to find a category. So it's in between a hormone and a protectant, osmoprotectant, maybe anti-aging is good. So this is spermidine and produce a lot of them. And uh, also in this investigations, fortunately, we found that our uh, biocontrol strain has a suicide vector working at 37 degrees, so that there is no uh, no uh, risk. So I will end with this network uh, from Lettuce, because this was also the title of my talk, that uh, this networking is very important for health, and for as well as for diseases, by the way. And analyzing all these networks, you can also find here, you can identify indicators of healthy plants, but you can also find indicators of diseased plants, and you can analyze the core microbiome. Here, we, these are all our lettuce data, and this is a core microbiome for, for all lettuce plants, this for the phylosphere, this for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for the rhizosphere, and we found out that Pathogens as well as beneficials uh, induce a microbiome shift on the plants, and I think this is very important to for for further analysis to analyze these microbiome shifts because maybe they are more important than other symptoms. So, and this is especially for Victoria. So, normally we come from the ecosystem level and we analyze everything for, from the ecosystem. But sometimes we also go into detail because I think it's very, very important. And, but this is not always easy. Here what we have done is we analyzed the interaction of penibacillus and verticillium and we found that they have a crosstalk uh, via Vox and if you put them on plates and uh, not together, but uh, with this hurdle, so and then they started a talk over 14 uh, days, and one produces antibiotic, the other responds uh, then with this antibiotic, and <laughs> it is so unbelievable. So if you have only two strains and you see how they interact, and then you have the whole ecosystem, only one microbiome, so only one rhizosphere, and you have thousand species, and then you can believe how they interact. Yeah, a lot of things to do, so this is my, my conclusion. And, but, but I really like also this detailed work from time to time to, to, to see that, what we, that we capture only a small proportion. And yeah, I, I think this is my last word. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. This is uh, the old woman of which established the symbiosis in Magulis. And so this is our vision also a little <coughs> bit to combine our results for also not only for plant health, also for our health. And I hope that I could show you that everything is really connected and that there are a lot of things which we have to do in the future. <laughs>